That's beautiful, Carol. I think you've really put it very well. I think some part of the engagement with books is about the whole personal world that you can build around it. I mean, I remember going up uh, with Enid Blyton, and you know, you had you hadn't visited England, but you could visualize an England of your own, which had all these wonderful things happening. And I think Enid Blyton was one of the authors who was so visual in the way she yes. described everything. Yes. I mean, you had those mouth-watering treats these kids seem to be having every time, and truly amazing. And and that's I think what what books really the the draw of books is that it allows each one to actually create your own world, as opposed to a visual medium like television or film which I guess there's a preconceived idea and uh, directors or producers. But let's get back to your uh, own life. I mean, so what are some of the books that you remember uh, actually growing up with, which really uh, have uh, left an impact and books you really remember even today um, over, the, over your teens perhaps and you know, as you grew up? Uh, I think it was a decade by decade progression. One thing I have to make very clear, I don't normally read what everybody is reading. I tend to come to all this in my own time. So by the time I got to college, everybody was talking about Ayn Rand, the fountainhead. If you hadn't read it, you were dead. Uh, they were talking about Karl Marx, oh, yes. huh? which I did not read. But they were also talking about uh, Thomas Merton and the Seven Story Mountain. They were, they were talking about you know, the motorcycle diaries. Oh, yes. They were talking about the beat poets who had been around in the 60s, but had become really big by then. So I was exposed to uh, Tom's, uh, what's that guy's name? The one who's written uh, Love and Loathing in Las Vegas. What is the name of the child? Hunter, Hunter Thompson. Oh, yes, yes. And uh, we were reading all that. At the corners of my mind, Tolkien was hovering, but it wouldn't be for another 20 years before I actually got into the Lord of the Rings and realized what a master he was. And it was a huge book. But I read it, and it sort of changed my life in many ways. It made me aware of the importance of the imagination to someone who fancies reading and fancies writing also. But I also loved To Kill a Mockingbird, J.D. Salinger, you know, Catcher in the Rye, yeah, and all these books, they were like sort of coming of age books. But we had coming of age books, which is something that I don't see now. I see people reading popular stuff and then forgetting about it. But books that sort of change your life or change the way you look at reading, I don't see very much of it now. That's true, I think. You know, a number of these classics which have endured the decades, and today uh, you're still talking about it, you're still making movies about it. And today I get this, there are a number of new titles available every single week, if not uh, every month. And uh, yet, how many of them actually remain in the collective consciousness for long? And that, I think, is what uh, you're alluding to. Uh, but coming back to something which I think everybody absolutely admires about you is your language, whether it's your diction, whether it's your grammar. What exactly shaped this part of you? I mean, who was responsible for uh, the, your, your prowess over the English language? My school, I have to admit. I went to a wonderful school, and we were encouraged to read. We were encouraged to speak. We had terrific teachers. You know, the teachers actually could do things better than us. Nowadays, I think the reverse is true. But uh, we were encouraged also to take pride in what we were saying. And that went not only for English, it went for Hindi as well. Okay. So you had truly bilingual or trilingual uh, students at that time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, mo but most of our thinking, I think, was like yours is also. It was shaped by the West. It was only in the 80s that I began to look at Indian writing in English. Earlier, it, there was a hunger in me to know what foreign writers thought about India, thought about Mumbai, Bombay then, thought about the places that we knew so intimately. Yeah. But then later I began to read Indian writers themselves. And there was a time when all I wanted were Indian writers. But now I, I have I've gone back to reading Western writers as well. And when I say Western writers, I'm talking about writers in English. And I've gone back to, now I have discovered, you know, the global, the international writer. So I read South African writers like Nadine Gordima, I read uh, Adichi, I read, uh, I'm looking forward to reading Amos Oz in translation. He's the Israeli writer who 
has uh, just won the Man Booker Prize for his novel, uh, A Horse Comes Into a Bar, so you can imagine. I find that structure, the structure of a novel, if it is very original, mm -hmm. it fascinates me. When I read Marlon James's uh, A Brief History of Seven Killings, the mm -hmm. first time I read it, he writes it in Argo, you know, in dialect. Right. Caribbean or whatever it is. And the first time I read it, I was just getting annoyed because there were so many characters and he jumped from one thing to another. Yet, as soon as I finished, the first thing I did was begin to read it again. That's the first time that has ever happened to me, that I have done a rereading immediately. And I couldn't put that book down. The same thing happened when I read Marquez for the first time. Couldn't understand the fascination with him. Mm -hmm. But I happened to pick up Love in the Time of Cholera. Yeah. <coughs> and I began to read it. And it was as if the world is swept away. And I surfaced on page 40. And I don't know how I made that journey. Then I realized what power this man had yeah. in the way he wrote that he could take over your soul and your consciousness and transport you from Mumbai to wherever, South America. Wow. At the same time now, thank God, I have also changed to Kindle. And Kindle has allowed me to discover so much writing. Came across this guy called Zulfikar Ghosh. Yeah. And he has written a book called The Something of Torment. Mm -hmm. And it's fabulous. And he is an Indian who settled in England and he's writing about South America and he's absolutely fabulous. That so really rich, brings... Sorry. So lush. He uses language <laughs> as if he's offering up a feast. You know, it's like food. When you eat it and when you, when you read it, you don't want to have a meal after that. Good for slimming as well. It's a very interesting tip for all our viewers, I think. Um, that brings me back to a question I would have asked you a little later. You already got a Kindle. So yes. what's your preference, ebook or hard copy? Uh, I have to admit, I cannot imagine life without my Kindle now. It took me a time. I was presented the Kindle by my son, and I just let it lie for six months, and then I activated it, and I found my way around it. But I can't do without it now. One of the reasons is why it allows me to read on the go. It allows me to read all the time. It allows me to read three books at a time. And it, it just allows me the luxury of convenience. It's changed the way I also read. My reading has already be, always been eclectic. But now it has reached epic proportions. Last year in September, I must tell you this story. I was looking at the last page of one of our very popular tabloids. And there was Khloe Kardashian in all her naked splendor, spilling over the page. And I, I went, you know, like elderly women everywhere. What is this woman doing? And what is this tabloid doing? And then my eyes slid to the side. And I saw a, a single column piece on a film which was being made by uh, Tom Hanks, who mm -hmm. makes wonderful films, Good. and it was being directed by Meg Ryan. And the film was Ithaca, uh, by, uh, and it was based upon a book by William Saroyan. Now, I'd always wanted to read Saroyan, mm -hmm. and it looked, very, it looked very interesting. And I went on to my, I went, I dropped everything at the breakfast table, went to my bedroom, picked up my Kindle, and in 10 minutes, I had bought three books by William Saroyan. I had bought Rock Wagram, I had bought Laughing, The Laughing Matter, and Boys and Girls Together. And I had waited a lifetime to read this man, a Nobel Prize winner, all because of Khloe Kardashian's breasts and the single column thing, you know? So that is the way my, you know, my reading has been changed by Kindle. I read bizarrely. And, as, and so widely, it would never have been possible without it. It's very interesting that, um, I mean, you have people today having this opinion that, uh, you know, books are sacrosanct and all these other kind of variations, whether it's television series or movies, they're all kind of vile 
uh, what can you say, you know, like corruption Anybody of, yeah, or the corruption of the, the genuine, um, you know, the pleasure of what a book should be actually read. And yet you have given two instances. One is of uh, get, getting to the Game of Thrones as a book uh, series through a television series. And now, apart the about from the Kardashian uh, example, you actually have come to that, again, through a very, uh, you know, from a different medium altogether, very eclectic route. So that's just pretty interesting. I mean, I think uh, what uh, in today's world, like you said, there's so many mixed media uh, kind of offerings where the written word is concerned. And I guess they, co they can coexist if I think one takes inspiration from something or the other, I guess. Yes, I remember when there was this excitement over Harper Lee's second book, oh, yeah. uh, Go Set a Watchman. And I had pre-ordered pre it as soon as I heard that she was, she was uh, writing it. And, but before, I had, before the date of the orders, they had already, the Guardian already had reviewed it. And they had reviewed it so marvelously, they had given an excerpt. And this excerpt, which I read on my phone at 4 o'clock in the morning, was accompanied by the sound of a train. You know, it sets her on a train going back home. Mm -hmm. And you can see this train. There's, it's multimedia at its best. Right. And you, it's an audio book. So you are listening to the book, and you are getting the feeling of the train. You are looking at a graphic of countryside going by. And that's how you are reading the book. So I thought it was a fantastic thing, except that the book is not good. <laughs> it's really not nothing compared with yeah. To Kill a Mockingbird. But now, if people don't want to read, maybe they want to experience books like this. And I would suggest that they do it. Because what is more important than words? And if television will bring you to the book, I say long live television series as well. I don't mind. There's, there's absolutely nothing wrong in it. I saw Narcos, the whole series. I binge watch a lot of stuff. I saw Narcos, and then I went backwards and I, I, uh, on Kindle, I downloaded Mark Bowden's uh, book on the entire Pablo Escobar yeah. investigation and his end. I shouldn't spoiler alert, no? Yeah. And then what I did was I went back and I read Marquez again. Okay. He, he, uh, I read News of a Kidnapping, which is the central premise of what brought him down. Yeah. But I read it from as a, Mar a Marquez thing. So you can imagine how Narcos <laughs> took me to Borden, who took me to Marquez, whom I knew. I would, might not have read it. And then I started downloading two or three of his other books. Yeah. Till then, I had only read that one. Love That's in the time of cholera. It's truly really fascinating. I mean, how you actually transcended mediums to go back to reading something, always. which uh, always, yeah? Always go right. back to uh, let me now get you to the other aspect of your life, which is so prominent. Um, how did you actually transition to writing and more importantly to journalism? I mean, you, you spent decades uh, with the Times of India and you recently stepped down as editor of the afternoon. So what was it that uh, got you to writing and especially to journalism? Reading. It was reading all the time. I had read so much. I found that I had an extraordinary facility with words. At times it came too easily. It was too glib. I tried not to use cliches. I also realized that, honestly, the mark of a decent writer is when you begin to look for your own analogies and your own metaphors. I mean, you're the dean of the St. Paul's Institute of Communication Education. You come across a number of aspiring journalists, scriptwriters, copywriters, and even authors. 
Um, what do you, what's the difference uh, do you see in today's generation who are aspiring writers uh, with the hundreds of people you've probably seen in your life uh, as a journalist uh, in terms of language, in terms of approach, in terms of just, just ideas and what they would like to uh, write about? Uh, I think that ability, ability-wise, when, when it comes to control of language, we've seen a great deterioration. But that is balanced out by the sheer audacity of all the people who want to write. Everybody wants to write. Everybody wants to self-publish. have to give young people. Thank you, Carol. That was a fascinating time we had talking with each other on, on books, something both of us love. Folks, that was the amazing, inspiring Carol Andrade in the inaugural episode of the Audrey Book World Show. Stay tuned in because we will have Carol back again for many an interesting conversation and many, many more such fascinating people as we go along. Thank you and signing off. <laughs> My name is Rimple from Aulari Book World. What's your name? Uh, Subalakshmi. Subalakshmi. So, Subalakshmi, are you looking for any particular book right now? Nothing. I'm just browsing through. I just like to uh, read through it and just, if something just piques my interest, I just pick it up. Okay. So, I don't go author-wise, I don't go theme-wise or anything, you know. Fiction, uh, non-fiction, anything goes. Oh, yeah, really? Yeah. And which is the latest book that you've uh, read? I just finished this, The Pyre. So I, I am a Tamilian. I wish I could read this in Tamil, but you know I just managed to pick this up an English translation. So it's really good. Yeah. yeah. Would you suggest it to anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I think uh, you know this is very lovely thing. You know even I have uh, you know a couple of uh, translated books, but even I wish that you know uh, how how far do you think they retain the essence of the original author? I wouldn't know. I have not. I've uh, read his earlier book, which was in Tamil, so uh, which is also nicely translated. Uh, this one I thought would did a very good job. In fact, yeah, so, yeah it did. It it tried to do away with a lot of the uh, you know the things that you know non Tamilian would not understand. Uh, but then it uh, it he just put in right the amount of words, Tamil words, and all that. So you know it made it easier, and we could understand it easily. Okay, thank you so much, Super Lakshmi, right? Yeah, thank you so much, Super Lakshmi. It was lovely having you. Hi. What's your name? Padmini Mishra. Padmini Mishra. Yeah. So, Padmini, can I ask you a few questions? Go ahead, that's the first time. <laughs> yeah? I've been here before, but no? you love reading? I, yeah, but I don't read really novels and all, but I love reading and, you know, What kind of books you read? Well, I read uh, mostly magazines and all that. I don't really read big books or anything, you know, no novels or anything so like that. That's, that. that's also an interesting mostly read. Magazine. Mostly magazines I read, most of the magazines. So I don't even like the you know, news or, or your, you know, any of this book or any of these magazines I read. And I've come here to buy books for my granddaughter. And I'm very fond of children's books and, you know, I've got a lot of grandchildren, like not mine alone, my nephews and nieces children, so I buy a lot of books for them. So first time I've come here to see because my daughter-in-law buys books from here. So I was asking them if they have anything, you know, like a bargain corner, I believe she told me, but this gentleman is saying, no, they don't have any such thing. So I want to ask around. How old is your young daughter? I mean, granddaughter. My daughter is two years old. Oh, that's too so young. I got a lot of, you know, like uh, nephews and nieces with children are like, you know, uh -huh. starting from 3 to 11, 12. That's awesome. It, it means you are inculcating reading habits since this oh, early yeah, age. Always, because my kids, my kids are uh, now 42 and 38. So they, you know, I, from the beginning only I used to buy a lot of books for them. So, you know. How did you, how would you buy books for them since you are not, you don't have a reading habit? No, I don't, but I know what the children would like to have, you know, like mainly, especially, like especially my young granddaughter now she's very scared of doctors going to the doctor so i usually buy you know books 
or toys for her, you know, which she can be, you know, I can read it to her and see what are the things, what the doctor uses, what she goes and, you know, uses and things like that, that you know, things like that. And boys, you buy all these sorts of, of things, <laughs> <laughs> you know, story books or, you know, or uh, car books or whatever, you know, airplanes, you know, how nowadays you get a lot of good books. I yeah. used to live in USA, so, you know, like there, you go to a library, you can take your children over there, they have library sessions, but, you know, so I'm kind of used to taking the kids, you know, to library. This is so interesting. Yeah. This is so interesting. Thank you for sharing, Padmini. Oh, Thank you. Okay. Find way of looking at industry. So I conduct velocity reading workshops where I help people to overcome the guilt of not reading books.